next uh, series of lectures um, from Asian Network of EBRD. Uh, today we have an exciting uh, lecture by legendary Victoria, Laura Victoria Gray, uh, who will tell us why 300 million people on the planet celebrate this uh, holiday. The event is, is sponsored by EBRD's Asian Network. And uh, we welcome you uh, to, to this event. Uh, we also have a few more events uh, spread out, uh, one tomorrow, and some in April, um, but uh, today's lecture is a really highlight. Uh, I was personally also looking forward for this lecture uh, quite a long time. So Laurel, welcome. Rashid, welcome over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kamola. Good afternoon, uh, good day everyone, because I know it must be different time around the world. Uh, my name is Rashid Shadat. So, so welcome uh, to our festival dedicated to Navruz and Easter, Pascha. Uh, it's our second day. Uh, I'll remind you, yesterday we had a gala concert with musicians and singers, and today we have uh, legendary Dr. Laurel Victoria Gray, Gray from Washington, D.C., United States, uh, with her lecture. And the lecture dedicated to Navruz, uh, this lecture examines the sacred roots of uh, various New Year traditions and how they can provide positive uh, physical and psychological benefits to all of us in this challenging time. Uh, before, before I pass on our um, platform um, to Laurel, I would like to just remind you, we, if you have any questions, uh, please leave in the chat room. So later on, by the end of our session, we're going to have about 15 minutes and we can have a little interview with um, Dr. Laurel Victoria Gray. And again, another thing I would like to ask, please for uh, better sound connection, for better sound, for better, um, please make sure that, that your microphones are off. Um, now is um, over to you, uh, Laurel, welcome. Um, I'm absolutely uh, over the moon to uh, greet you to our, our festival and happy Nowruz. Happy Nowruz and Salam everybody. Thank you for the invitation to present this information. Full disclosure at the very beginning, I am not Iranian or Central Asian, but I have played with on stage. And as somebody who is not directly of this culture, um, I have participated in this wonderful holiday for several decades now. So I might be able to share some information for others who are just discovering this holiday. And for those for whom Noruz, Navruz, Nevruz is their own beloved holiday, we hope you will share some of your happy memories of the celebration at the end of my uh, presentation. You probably have really interesting stories to share. So for Persian and Central Asian cultures, the new year celebrated at the spring equinox. This ancient holiday of no Ruz means new day in Persian. And it's the first day of the first month of that Persian calendar, Favardin, who celebrates rebirth and renewal. It's been linked to the mythical king, Jamshid, who in a struggle with the killing forces of winter, saves mankind from destruction by creating and sitting in this fabulous gold studded throne, lifted by demons into the heavens. You know, if we could only find Dan yeah, they probably could have, if those demons had been around, they could have gotten that ship loose from the Suez Canal a lot sooner, but anyway. So they <laughs> lift him, thrown up into the, in the sun, in the sky, and he shines like the sun. Then he's acclaimed by all the world's creatures and Jamshid scatters all the jewels, proclaiming that this is the new day, the no ruse and the beginning of the new year. Well, right now, we all could use a new day and rebirth. We are a world out of balance. The pandemic has driven us into isolation where we depend increasingly on our screens, like right now, Zoom is cool, but you know, we're on them all the time. Our computers, our phones, for more aspects of our life. And while these tech tools have allowed us to continue to work and communicate, they've also led to an unhealthy addiction that has negative physical, emotional, and psychological impact. Norus can restore physical and psychological health. Yes, by renewing that connection with nature and reminding us of the need in, in man 
and woman to return and rediscover nature. And when we rediscover nature, we can also rediscover the wisdom of our ancestors in the primal urge to dance. Nauru celebrations take us out of doors, urging us to breathe and move and dance and to witness the earth's return to life. Dance was humanity's original activity that built a sense of community and this shared purpose necessary to revive to survival. And this wonderful uh, quote I wanna share, Nauru's is the commemoration of a great reminiscence, that of mankind's kinship with nature. Every year, this absent-minded child who busy with his own artificial works and creations is reminded by the seducing recollections of Nauru's to return to his mother's lap and to celebrate this return, this renewed meeting with her. This deeply rooted need to connect with nature and with each other ex exists in many Silk Road cultures. So I have put together some uh, slides to share with you and I'm gonna go to that now so um, you can have some something to look at while I continue. Okay, so um, we know that um, with the Kurdish population, let's see, I have to go to this. Uh, 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 uh. I was just slow. So <clears throat> for the Kurds, the seamless endless line of dancers dressed in colorful holiday finery stretch across the, sun, the countryside and people connect in the most literal sense of world, the word by holding hands and dancing shoulder to shoulder. Um, and in the former Soviet republics of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Az Azerbaijan, just to name a few, all sharing deep historic and cultural connections with past Persian empires, this ancient spring holiday was not so much supported by the Soviet Union. But after independence, these nations revitalized Navruz, Nevruz with huge public celebrations featuring music and dance. Now, um, in Uzbekistan, um, right after independence, um, when I was living there, um, I helped prepare sumalak. I had no idea what I was doing, but um, the women would stay up all night. So you get this, this image here. Um, singing and dancing around this huge cauldron and stirring the sumalak, uh, which of course is a, a wheat pudding similar to what the Persians have as samanu. And I was actually asked some very personal questions uh, before I was allowed to partake, partake in this ritual because they had to be sure that I was ritually clean. And I imagine <laughs> there's some of the same questions that would be connected to uh, going into a mosque or praying. So I passed the test and I was allowed to participate, but they said if, if, if someone were unclean, it could make it so that the sumalak didn't turn out. So that would have been like, I would have been blamed for the whole neighborhood, you know? Um, and in, in Azerbaijan on uh, Chahar Shanbe, which is the last Wednesday of the year, we'll talk about that more later. Um, I was there for a Nauru celebration and the people would go outside and gather and leap over small bonfires. I mean, even just in the street, they would put up some small fire and they would jump over it, surrounded by onlookers who would break into the ancient Yali line dance. So that idea of a communal celebration um, and dance being involved. When we made Sumalak, we were singing and dancing and the only male who was around was uh, the son of of one of the women who would bring us firewood to go underneath the giant cauldron. So it was really a woman's celebration. And this is the critical uh, component in traditional Nauru celebrations. Everyone dances, all right? So while amateur and professional ensembles may take the center stage, all ages can join in the communal dance expression of joy. This is another gift of Nauru's. Dance has benefits for mature adults. So cross-sectional studies have shown that older adults who dance on a regular basis have greater flexibility, postural stability, balance, physical reaction time, and cognitive performance more than older adults who do not dance on a regular basis. For even 
more dramatic is the growing evidence that stimulating one's mind by dancing can ward off Alzheimer's disease and other dementia, such as physical exercise, as much as physical exercise can keep your body fit, but dance also increases cognitive acuity at all ages. A study published in the New England Journal of Medicine analyzed various leisure activities in senior citizens and concluded that, are you, are you ready? Dancing was the only physical activity associated with a lower risk of dementia. So while you see older people dancing, you may say, oh, they're crazy. Actually, they're probably the only ones who aren't crazy. No, just, just saying, it's really good for you and it, we should be open to having seen all ages. And in traditional societies, everyone dances. The dance changes. The dance for young people, of course, is more vigorous and faster, but for older people, it's more elegant and stately, but everyone dances and they're welcome to dance. Now, if all of you non-Persians and non-Central Asians have been convinced to start celebrating Nowruz and dancing, let's take a look at the unique traditions that help us to assure healthy, happy, and prosperous coming year. So we'll get our next slide to happen. Let's see, yeah. So the question of who owns Nowruz, Navruz can be hotly debated at time, especially on, on YouTube when you see a video, it's like, it's our holiday, you're stealing it. But you know, these accusations are lit silly because unlike other holidays, Nowruz is not based on a human event. It's not based on a victorious battle or the founding of, of some country or someone's birthday. It's nature's holiday. And guess what? The equinox happened before human civilization, right? So by this fanciful leap of imagination, you know, they had no ruse when we had dinosaurs on Earth. Can you imagine dying Easter eggs, you know, dinosaur eggs? Okay. Okay, they wouldn't have, T-Rex wouldn't have had problems because his legs are too short. But but the idea that it's 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 really nature that's driving this event when uh, both day and night are of equal length. It happened before there were humans. So it's actually, the holiday is Earth's holiday. And in most of human age, history, with our agrarian roots, the beginning of the growing season was greatly anticipated. Why? Because our survival depended on it. And if I knew, if I had to survive on what comes out of my garden to live through the year, I wouldn't make it like two weeks, right? So, so this, you know, you're waiting and waiting. You're waiting for the earth to wake up because you got to plant those crops. You're probably low on supply. How much does thing, how many, how, you know, how long do your apples or potatoes or, or whatever last? You know, it's, it's people needed that new fresh food source. And that may also be connected to sumalak or samanu or this wheat pudding because it's so rich in vitamins. If you think about a whole, uh, you know, this, we're at the end of winter and there's not fresh vegetables, not fresh fruits. People are maybe not having the best nutrition. And then you have this sumalak or samanu and you start to build up again. So in this ag agrarian societies that we had early on after hunter and gatherer, we went to the next stage of development. Um, you see a lot of circle dances. Uh, this you see this is really ancient this is um neolithic this image here from pottery but you can see that they're you know they're dancing together i love this because this of course are you know contemporary humans but if you look at the shadows look it's the same image dancing in circles why are circles so powerful oh we just had a little um intrusion by a feline uh and you'll see why the felines are important to this story because they're connected to the goddess Anahita or Nana who's often presented with um, be, riding a lion. So we have, it, we have small domestic lions um, in my household and uh, they decided to wake up. <clears throat> and you'll see also with the um, 
with the Kurds, for example, out in the mountains, lines and lines of people connecting and dancing for Nowruz. Why are so, circles so important? Because a circle is the ultimate democracy. If you think about it, everybody is equal distance from the center and they are, uh, it can expand and contract. Uh, and you'll see, it's so interesting, this image of the, the linked dancers sometimes appears inside of pottery. So imagine, uh, you know, a jar that you would put water or whatever in. And instead of just decorating the outside, they'll have image of dancers painted on the inside of the vessel so that only the person pouring it would know it's there. So it must have some deep and religious significance, uh, rit ritual significance to do this because this takes time and energy. And when, when you have a culture that's kind of just basically surviving on the edge, uh, these sorts of activities uh, to create art means that you've got to take time and energy away from food production. Circles also imitate the yearly cycle and the movement of planets. So remember that ancient Persians were known as skilled astronomers and were keenly aware of the celestial movements of the spheres. That they, they knew exactly when Nowruz was coming, that equinox and how to celebrate it. And we see this connection with the goddess Anahita. Here she is with her sitting on a lion. And this is um, from the area of what is now Afghanistan. And here is Anahita again. Um, and on a silver uh, bowl or plate. And the reason we have that is because, you know, precious metals don't um, decay as much as other items. So again, for your society to put the time and effort and wealth into creating this, it has got to be something really, really significant. So, um, so again, felines and goddess energy being connected. <clears throat> Here's another image of Anahita and uh, then a costume that I made for Silk Road Dance Company when we often get asked to perform at No Ruse events. And I thought, well, let's have a, a personification of spring and all the, the beauty and growth. Again, it's, it's archetype because think of the goddess energy. You know, the early civilizations, the deity was female. It makes sense because human life comes onto the planet through the body of a female. And in some early, early cultures, there's not a clear connection between pregnancy and birth and intercourse. So someone could experience intercourse all their lives um, and never become pregnant and give birth. And then other females it only takes one time. So it seems something magical and mysterious, like, oh, I think I'll give birth. <laughs> Just So all this power uh, of over birth and new life is attributed to females. So goddesses were very um, much esteemed and central to a lot of the spiritual practices of, of Central Asia and the Near East. So here we go to Persepolis, um, that, a magnificent uh, palace that was destroyed by the armies of uh, Alexander the Great. And they tried to blame it on a dancing girl because you know <laughs> that's how they are. Oh, it was her fault. You know, no thought that the armies wouldn't have been there unless they were um, you know, attacking, right? Uh, so this is often interpreted as being a Norus procession. So that's how important it was. And all these, these objects are some, you know, they look about like lamb, a little lamb. And, you know, are those eggs? What are they carrying? There's ideas about that. But that it was so important to uh, recognize this holiday that they would create all this art and architecture to reaffirm that. We see more of the procession of, of that. So again, if you think about it, you only know for sure if your crops are gonna grow 
Does it seem to be a connection if you do the proper rituals, if you celebrate it, and it's also a way for them to show their their uh, loyalty and subservience to the um, the the ruler. We also have a, a you're probably very familiar with this uh, fresco from Afro Siab, and some people have also interpreted this as a another depiction of a Nowruz procession, everybody gathering and um, showing, giving gifts and showing the importance of that holiday. So it's definitely in our in our DNA, I guess we could say, or our, our, our history to mark this uh, beginning of the cycle. And it's really fairly re uh, recent, recent that um, we weren't so dependent personally on uh, agriculture, of course, huge parts of the world are very dependent on that. So the beginning of the growing season is something to watch for and to treasure. Um, I want to share a poem by Jalaluddin Rumi because it's a wonderful poem about spring. And, you know, what will we, how could we talk about uh, Persian and Central Asian culture without poetry? So this was translated by Coleman Barks. Again, the violet bows to the lily. Again, the rose is tearing off her ground. The green ones have come from the other world, tipsy like the breeze up to some new foolishness. Again, near the top of the mountain, the anemone sweet features appear. The hyacinth speaks for formally to the jasmine, peace be with you and peace to you lad. Come walk with me in this meadow. Again, there are Sufis everywhere. The bud is shy, but the wind removes her veil suddenly. My friend, the friend is here like the water in the stream, like a lotus on the water. The narcissus winks at the wisteria, whatever you say, and the clove to the willow, you are the one I hope for. The willow replies, consider these chambers of mine yours, welcome. The apple, orange. Why the frown? So that those who mean harm will not see my beauty. The ring dove comes asking, where, where is the friend? With one note, the nightingale indicates the rose. Again, the season of spring has come and a spring source rises under everything, a moon sliding from the shadows. Many things must be left unsaid because it's late, but whatever conversations we haven't had tonight, we'll have tomorrow. So how do we get ready for, ready for this holiday, for the celebration? And it, and it's new, no ruse is still going on. So this isn't too late if, if you haven't already done it. Spring cleaning. This is so common to many, many uh, other cultures but it's a custom that we share. And after being locked out of our homes for a year, some spring house cleaning may be in order, right? The tradition, Iranian tradition is called Khane Tkani, which means literally house shaking, all right, house shaking. And this is a great image. Of course, you're shaking out the rugs, shaking ourselves awake after this long dormancy, there's also a spiritual dimension because, well, after all, cleanliness is next to godliness. And this is an act of purification. Clean homes attract clean energy. They attract angelic, angelic creatures like the farishta that can protect the occupants from evil. Remember the Zoroastrian traditions that are common to many of these cultures good thoughts, good words, good deeds. There's always a struggle between the forces of good and evil, between the forces of, of winter and of darkness and the forces of spring and summer and light. So this constant struggle is happening and humans are supposed to participate in this. You're supposed to be on the side of good. You're supposed to actively do, be doing good acts. Cleaning your house then is a sacred act. And as I said, we need it now, we really need it. Now, other activities include coloring eggs, 
which does this sound familiar? Okay, for people who celebrate Easter, of course, very familiar. And of course, there are shopping trips that are going to happen. I love these these uh, Persian eggs. Look at this this you know the like the Persian miniature details, and of course the um, Eastern uh, Central Asian traditions of miniature paintings on these eggs. They're just gorgeous. So in Tehran, they'll have these giant eggs. Artists paint in different ways, and all the shopping. In fact, you can you can go to YouTube and you can watch like um what uh, live feeds of people shopping uh, at the different markets for all the things that you need for your Nauru celebration. And you'll see some of these items actually appear on the half scene, which is the the ritual table that is set up. Also gifts, because you're going to give gifts. So give gifts to, to children. Um, and so this, this excitement of preparing for a holiday, uh, for Westerners, you might think about the Christmas markets and shopping and, and um, you know, all the special food ingredients you might need for baking cookies or special food that you make for the celebration. But Nowruz is sort of like a mega holiday because it it's like Thanksgiving in that people get together. This is for Americans, right? You get together and you give thanks and you're with your family on that day. Um, it's also like Christmas, giving gifts, again, gather together. It's like the uh, Western New Year's, although it never made sense to me to have New Year's when everything's still, still dead, right? Of course, we know that the tradition of celebrating the New Year's, that's it, that again, it, it, it goes back to another calendar and another time. So that's another advantage of Nowruz. It's not linked to a special calendar. It's linked to actually astronomical phenomenon. And then you have this uh, tradition of kids going from door to door, singing and getting treats. It's kind of like Halloween. So it goes on and it's like also like Easter, the idea of rebirth and regeneration. So it's a mega holiday. And Persian Nowruz goes for 13 days. So it, it really, again, it's a chance to be outside, uh, to see each other, to visit. Of course, you visit your, your eldest relatives first and then into birth order. Again, this respect is shown. Now, <clears throat> there's always heralds of spring. So sometimes you can tell spring is coming by new birds. The birds that aren't around in the winter, they show up. So that's a herald of spring or certain flowers or plants start to put their little green noses up and you're going, oh, it's a herald of spring. So this, this is very common. And, and of course in the West with the Western uh, celebrations of new year, new year, you have, you know, father time. So you have the old man with the white beard and the, the uh, coming on the scene that he's, He's the old year that's dying off. And then you have the baby new year. This idea of, of death and then life is also very ancient in civilization. So the idea that the king, some, some, that the king must die for the new uh, birth to come. So in these cultures though, they have different heralds. So here, that's so cute. The kids going door to door. When I was in Baku for, for Nowruz several years ago, the, you know, you'd hear the kids would come to the door and they would sing and they'd be rewarded with coins or um, and also little cookies and things that were special for that time. So that and they're all in their neighborhood because people know each other. Like people don't know each other, they're neighbors in, in some of our modern society. But how fun for the children to be able to do this. So there are archetypes of these heralds of spring and heralds of the new year. So we have, you know, father time, we have the baby new year in, in the West. And we have uh, in Azerbaijan, they have like Kosa and Kessel, these, they're, they're humorous figures, you know, there's all joking and kind of, you know, making people feel happy and have stories. You have uh, with Uzbeks, you have Bobo Dekan. So it's a farmer again, connected to agriculture. It's different in Iran. You have Amun Norus, 
So here he is with the white beard. So it looks kind of like our Santa Claus. And then you have Haji Firuz. Now I'm going to give you a trigger warning because Haji Firuz traditionally is done in blackface, which uh, is very troubling. And it has been something that has the Persian community in the US they have recreated this figure. When, when we do this, there's something called um, disjunction. When you have a place or a practice that's sacred in one culture and then that culture is overwhelmed by another, but the place remains sacred or the individual like Hercules, uh, of course, was associated with the pagan world. So what did the Christians do? Oh, we can't really get rid of Hercules. I know we'll make him a symbol of the Christian virtue of fortitude. So you sort of uh, dress them up in new clothes to keep that same sense of, of sacred power, but you just it miss it, you interpret it in different ways. So I'm going to show you some traditional images of Haji Firuz. So you see um, the blackface uh, clearly shown as somebody with. Um, African heritage. And here's another cartoonish kind of figure or toy. But, and this is a man who's put on the blackface to perform. And they, they go through the streets and villages to alert people ahead of time that spring is coming or is coming. Haji Firuz plays a drum or like a tambourine. He sings, he has funny things that he says. And this is why I, there's a, they have a story that they tell about him. All right. So um, one explanation connects him to the Iranian prince Siavash, who's described in the Shahnameh. And if you know this um, story, he's falsely accused of, uh, I guess, sexual misconduct. And the only way he can prove his innocence is to ride through a mountain of, of flames on his horse. And they say that in that process, his face got covered with soot because he's riding through flame. Okay, but these other cultures who are uh, kinship cultures don't have someone who's black face. We do know that Siavash had, was venerated in Central Asia as a god of dying and reviving vegetation. Again, the cycle of death and, and rebirth uh, to make the crops happen. So uh, I actually looked at some interesting um, research and information. And you have to remember that there was slavery in Iran, in Persia, up until 1929. So African people were enslaved. And there's some of the verses that Haji Faru sings are about pleasing his master. I think that he might have originally been a real person. The closest connection I can think of is something that happens around here every Halloween, where everybody gets up and they dance thriller, Michael Jackson's thriller. Now, in 100 years, are they going to remember Michael Jackson or, you know, what caused that, that when that video came out uh, with Thriller? So he was a real person. And maybe Haji Farouz was a real person who was very charismatic. He was funny, humorous, but he's definitely in a role of, of, as a, a jester, someone who doesn't quite speak Persian correctly. And so I think that that is, might suggest that instead of being... Um, Siavash with a sooty face, he's actually uh, an enslaved African person who entertains with his, his singing and dancing and humorous stories. And, you know, it, it wasn't until 29 that a bill was introduced that gave all the slaves freedom in, in uh, Persia and declared them equal to other Iranians. So although some African slaves were dispersed across Iran. Many of them settled in the southern regions of the uh, Persian Gulf area. They have very interesting dance traditions there too. So happily, um, American Iranians, here, here you can see blackface Haji Farouz entertaining um, in this uh, drawing, but 
this is the solution that Iranian Americans have come up with. And I think it's a great idea. So he's still wearing the signature red clothing, the red pants, the red top, again, red being a link to fire. And of course, fire is sacred in Zoroastrianism. It's also sacred in uh, traditional Mongol culture. If you read about um, the great uh, Khan, uh, Xingis Khan, there would be two large fires that anyone approaching the Khan would have to pass through the fires. So this association of fire and purity is important. So red is powerful. And I heard from my, my dear teacher, Kazahandas Mohamedova, that Tamara Hanum would tell her, you should eat food that is red. It's very good to eat food that is red colored. She says, I never know why, but so the idea of red and health and vigor is very strong. So here's Haji, Haji Farouz, but now he has the colors of the Iranian flag painted on his face. So it's an example of taking an archetypal figure and then um, changing it to be uh, more sensitive or more uh, useful or just it's an, our, our society is always changing. So he's still important as a herald of spring, but his costume or his face makeup has changed a little bit. So one of the most important parts of the celebration is the haf scene. Haf scene means seven items that start with S. Sin is a, the letter S. And they have names and they mean things. Now, what I have found fascinating is that even some Iranians, contemporary Iranians living in America, they don't know what these different things mean. And that's kind of sad because this is very, very symbolic. Now, no Iranian has ever told me this, but I look at the Hafsin and I see an altar. And if you've studied in indigenous um, cultures or you know folk magic, this is this is an altar. Well, what is an altar after all? An altar is a sacred space where offerings and prayers are directed. So you you have a focus. It's a visual focus. Um, for you put your desires and your hopes. It's very strong. So, and most of the things that you find on the half scene are things that you would find in your, in your kitchen or your garden. Okay, well, there's a couple of things that you'd have to have a Persian garden or a kitchen, but if it, most of them, they're very calm. This is very uh, true of folk magic, that it's always something that you just have at hand, but you use in a different way. Now, um, I said that it's seven items that start with the letter S. We have to remember that seven is a very powerful sacred symbol in the East. So we have the seven gates of Ishtar. Um, we have, uh, for those who know the, the Old Testament, the book of Esther, um, there's connection in, in other discourses, not actually in the Bible, that she had seven handmaidens seven that represented seven days of the week. We have seven colors of the rainbow. Uh, we have, I mean, seven notes in, this, in the scale. So seven is very powerful. And this idea of seven, again, kind of has a magical um, vibration. Apparently before the uh, advent of Islam, it wasn't seven S items, it was seven sh items. So Instead of the letter S, it was the etch sound, okay? But that included the, the um, uh, wine, okay, sharab. And wine is not okay in Islam. So they had to throw out everything that started with SH. So the, so the belief goes. But let's look at what is contempor in contemporary times and traditionally, more traditionally. So first you have sabza, everybody, everybody knows that, right? It's the green sprouts, little green sprouts, all right? And that is really hope because you can get out there and start planting. You actually start, you start to sprout these ahead of time, but it's just a reassurance. Samanu, we talked about that very um, nutritious wheat pudding and it can symbolize affluence. Senjet is the dried fruit fruit of the oleaster tree symbolizing love, something like lotus. This is hard to find. You have to go to a, a Persian market, but if you can think of something else that could uh, have a, a symbolic meaning. Sir, garlic, so that's health and medicine. And how many times have we 
discovered that garlic is really good um, in keeping health. People, again, didn't have modern medicine, so they, they found certain herbs and, uh, and uh, other organic items that could help assure good health. Seeb. Seeb is the apple, of course, symbolizing health and beauty. Somak, those are berries. And it, somak, again, it's this red kind of color. Um, and it symbolizes the color of sunrise. Again, new day, new dawning. And serke, which is my favorite right now. Um, it's vinegar symbolizing the wisdom of age and patience. Think about what has been going on with COVID-19. Who were the most vulnerable people? It was, it was the elders, elder generation. And when you don't honor that, then what happens? Because those are the people who have been down the road of life and they, they, they have experience, they have wisdom. So the serke, the vinegar needs to be on that, on that half scene to honor that, it, to honor our elders and to honor their wisdom and experience. Here's another beautiful uh, depiction of this. And I have to say that uh, Iranians really take great pride. It's usually the women who set up the Hafsin in making it as beautiful as possible um, with beautiful dishes and with the flowers. There's other things that we can go on the Hafsin that aren't part of that sacred seven, but they're usually there. One is Sunball, which of course is the hyacinth. And just before we began today, I was checking out my garden and uh, my hy hyacinths have started to bloom. There's Sekke, which is coin. So that's money and prosperity. Sat, which is of course time. So there could be a clock there. And that also helps to, to keep track of the actual moment of no roost. And then eggs, of course, what could be a better symbol of fertility than eggs? The mirror, it's a symbol of self-reflection. Candles, of course, we need light. We need more light and enlightenment. Then the controversial goldfish. It's not just Haji Farouz that's controversial. Why is it? Because what people would do then at the end, at uh, the very end of the Noru celebration, they would take the goldfish and let them loose in a stream or something. But the goldfish, it's not so great for them. We're finding that they die. I, I think that traditionally people had ponds like in the middle of their garden and they might've taken the goldfish out of that and then put them back in. But now they're saying, don't, please don't you hurt the goldfish. Instead, people are taking like a, a glass uh, jar or, or, or a vase, it's glass and they put water in it, but they put instead an orange. So that, that has that gold sun-like object in there. And then finally the book, which is a symbol of wisdom. Um, it could be Quran, um, but often it's the Hafez, the poetry of Hafez. And then you read from that poetry. And this um, also ties in with bibliomancy, which if you know, when you want to find out the future, you uh, open up a book and then you find, ah, there's the answer. Whatever the page it turns to is my answer. There uh, was in Iran this practice of of uh, going to a falchiar or, or fortune teller. And there were these huge books that were made called faname and they had large images in the very large, um, interesting images. And you'd go to the falchiar and you, you know, the page would be open. You'd ask the question, the page would be open and only the falchiar could, could interpret it and tell you what it meant. Should, should I go on this caravan for trade or should, I marry this person or should I, you know, whatever act we have in our life, a decision, we always want to know what's going to happen next. And this one is also, this is very uh, emotional for me because the idea of, of the Haf scene culturally is so powerful. These are doctors a year ago in Iran. And if you remember how bad COVID was there and yet they made sure that they had a half scene there in the hospital, which I'm sure, again, it gave hope and, and positive wishes for the, all those people working in the hospital. So we move on to Tahar Shambe Suri, which is that last Wednesday before the new year. So it's already passed. 
but this is jumping over fire. And I'm sure that in a lot of your cultures, you do that too. It's to remove all your sins, to start the new year pure. And uh, you see, like this is in Kurdistan, very ancient uh, traditions, people jumping over fire. I worry about wearing long dresses doing this, but uh, I guess they know what they're doing. Uh, and then this is the green kosa in Azerbaijan. You see that pointed headdress. You see he's often associated with Haji Farouz also. But if you look at those really old um, depictions uh, in Bactria, people had these, these pointed headdresses. So these guys are really ancient and maybe we've forgotten why they do these things and why they dress this way, but it's, it's a resonance from our ancient human experience. More jumping over fire. And here, jumping over fire. This is in the state of Maryland and jumping over fire. Uh, this is uh, members of uh, Silk Road Dance Company. We're, we're dancing Yali around the fire and holding hands, which we haven't been able to do for a long time and soon we will. And the, the children, again, going just before Nowruz to go door to door and sing and get gifts. Then the actual moment, the actual moment, again, remember that um, Persians were known for being uh, great astronomers and of course, Central Asians too. So they could know the exact moment when Nowruz is gonna happen. And everybody's there, even the family cats. I'd like to see representation of cats special foods, like this is a, a, a special kind of rice with fish, it's a traditional dish that's uh, served that day. And of course, all the special treats and cookies in addition to samanu or um, uh, sumalak. This is a, a, a Uzbek kids in the sort of carousel, but again, it keeps that idea of cir the circle and rotation going back. Um, this is my dance company. This is a Kurdish dance. So in the US, we have big Nowruz festivals too. Um, and again, my ensemble. So and using dancing with Sabza is also uh, done in Azerbaijan. And let's look at some of the great celebrations. So um, again, the circle dance, the idea of being together. So you just see the joyousness and, and you can tell it's still cold outside. Uh, Turkmen, of course. And then uh, the uh, Navru celebrations among the Central Asians. Karakalpax at the ginormous <laughs> um, Navru celebrations in Uzbekistan today. I mean, this, this level of national holiday, it didn't exist in, in Soviet times. Um, in fact, when I when I was there, um, it was ninety two. It's just after independence, and you know it, we made sumalak, but there weren't these big holidays. So uh, it's really great to see these uh, reasserting themselves. The people uh, taking these holidays back to their hearts, and the colors and everything. It's the colors of spring. You see these lovely young women. Uh, performing and again, youth and beauty is a big part of of Nowruz. I love this uh, this Tajik stamp. You can see how again, what well, how does a nation decide to represent itself? What's important? What do you put on your stamps? What do you put on your stage? Um, what silver plate do you have someone make to show a goddess? All these are decisions that a, a culture makes at some level. Again, you can see, this is my dance company, but you can see this is in Northern Virginia. The people, they're warmly dressed because it's very cold outside. Again, people love, sun, but you have to go out. So the very last holiday, and, and this, if you may recognize, this is the former Empress of Iran uh, who has family in Northern Virginia and often comes to these events. Representing different cultures here, you probably can identify. Uyghur and Azeri and, and Kurdish and then uh, sort of Persian. Sizde Bedar is the very last day of Nowruz. And it's really the 13th day. The idea that 13 is unlucky and you need to leave your house. You need to go outside no matter what. 
even if it's raining, you need to you set up tents, you need to go outside. So this again, you're you're forced to go out and breathe fresh air and be healthy, whether you want to or not. It's an important part. And that comes up um, this Friday, says the Bidar. That sabza that you grew so carefully in your home uh, to be sprouted in time for uh, no ruse and for your half scene, they're, they're sent out. And again, this has symbolic value. Girls, unmarried girls will like tie grass and, you know, am I going to get married? And we always want to know what's going to happen. And I should circle back to the Chahar Shaham Shaham Besuri, that uh, that night when you jump over the fire, you're also supposed to eavesdrop and listen to conversations of strangers. Why? Because what they say might reflect on what's going to happen for the new year. So we should always be careful what we're saying because someone might be listening in. Um, and if it's something positive, like, you know, I'm so glad now we have vaccines and we're all going to get over this COVID is going to go away and humanity will be restored. Anything uh, positive that you can share. Again, it goes back to the, the Zoroastrian idea, good thoughts, good words, good deeds, because everything starts with our thoughts. And then what we say, and then finally, what we do wanted to share this. This is at the White House under the Obama administration. This is my dance company. It was the very first No Ruse celebration. Um, so you have no idea how happy everyone was, mainly Iranians, but also people from all of the, the cultures that celebrate No Ruse, including um, Afghanistan. And Eric was so excited for this to be recognized, this holiday to be recognized in the White House, which is really the people's house. So it's become now an American holiday. People are, are understanding it more. It's becoming more widespread. And I, I think that it's really for everyone, or at least in the, in the Northern hemisphere, because uh, it doesn't happen at the same time in the so Southern hemisphere. But the idea that to go, turn back to nature is really key. And I want to thank everybody for listening. I hope that um, I shared some interesting information, and I would really love for this to be open up for your um, questions. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Laurel. Uh, I'm pretty sure um, everyone enjoyed it as I did. And I really liked the few points you made, first of all, about, about Navruz and who this celebration to belongs to. And they've been like, you know, rumors and arguments for many years. And I really agree with you what you said. It's, it doesn't matter who you are and where you were born, you still can celebrate um, the Navruz and what's your beliefs and what's your background and what's your nationality. And another thing is about, um, you made the point about the dancing, which, uh, which would keep us healthy mobile and sane. I think I'm going to carry on dancing <laughs> no matter how old I am. <laughs> because sometimes I tell myself I'm 45 probably I should take it easy. No. After what you said I'm going to carry on even more dancing and cheer up myself and people around me. And the third thing you um, pointed uh, about uh, keeping your place clean. I, we're talking about this and I'm having a flashback Every, every year in March, my mom and like my sister would clean entire house. I mean, a carpet cleaning or curtains cleaning or windows would be like shiny. We would go and prepare for ourselves uh, for Navruz. And now it was like fun time to do this it was entire family. I really enjoyed that period and I was like having a flashbacks. And also um, people who were listening to us left the comment, um, Excellent point about the health benefits of dancing, Rosa uh, Berko. And also Kamola Mahmoudova said, my mom made, made me wash our carpets like, like this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm having a pleasure. I mean, every uh, spring we would do that with family. Beautiful costumes uh, as a net network. Shireen Saadi said, how nice. And, I, and I'm very thrilled, um, Victoria, about you performed in the White House for Obama, and obviously it's been uh, recognized by, uh, you know, government. It's, it's amazing, and it makes me even more proud of our celebration. 
and best lecture of Nauruz every, uh, ever heard by Kamala. Thank you. Rosa Verka, wonderful, insightful story about Nauruz. Uh, thank you very much, ASM Network. Agree. Katta Rahmat, Yekaterina, from Yekaterina. Katta Rahmat, thank you very much, Laurel. Uh, Shirin Saadi says, really wonderful story, and thank you for explaining what Nauruz is. Daniela says, wonderful and interesting insights. Paramita Kar, um, wonderful presentation. Yes, very resonant with many traditions from the Silk Road. Thank you. And Asian Network, thank Laurel. We, uh, we such a delighted story. I've learned a lot about Nauruz today. <laughs> Tari Osman, educational, inspiring, and wonderfully entertaining. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I absolutely enjoyed it, and uh, thank you very much for preparing us. Yes. Even, even I've been in this culture for since I've been born, and today I learned even more about my culture. Yes. And another question, I'm, I'm pretty sure that many uh, journalists or many uh, people ask you before, what made you to learn culture and music and dance from Central, uh, Central Asia? What was the point? What was, the, what was the turning point when you realized, oh, I'm going to go for this? <laughs> well, um, I, here, let me stop sharing so you can actually hear. Yeah, so um, I was just so attracted to, uh, from childhood to every, anything Eastern. And I even did an a, a oil painting when I was 11. It's like mosques and minarets. I grew up in Spokane, Washington. There's nothing like that in my hometown. But aesthetically, it just called me. Um, we had some records that I would listen to back when they had records, right? Um, of uh, Ippolita Ivanov in the steppes of Central Asia, all the Russian Orientalist musicians. Just aesthetically, it, it, it really called to me. Uh, and I just, uh, I, I had to have more and it was so rare in those days to find anything. I remember going to our main public library and getting everything I could on this part of the world or any music. Now it's all at our disposal, it's so easy, but maybe because it was difficult, I appreciated it more because all the all this information's at our fingertips right now, but you know, we're, we're just looking at Instagram. I know, and when, and when you start learning, probably there was not much information. There was an internet and the connection between, probably when you started, it was still Soviet era and when yes. Pakistan was part of Soviet era. And I do remember, we didn't have much knowledge or much information about the United States, but I remember the program about you, how you were dedicated your life about Central Asian culture, dance, and music, and it was quite fascinating to me to watch and uh, follow you. Well, thank I, you. Yeah. So, yeah. So, there's a whole other conversation for uh, another time. Um, but I thank everybody for for. Uh, thank you very in. much. <laughs> thank you so much, Laurel. Thank you so much, Rashid. Lauren, that was. Uh, Absolutely the best lecture I have ever heard in my life about No Rules. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. Uh, I have never heard so much connection with the, actually Easter. Um, we really um, would like to see you back with another lecture or dance class for us. But today, we, with the hand on our hearts, we say thank you very much and we look forward to see you soon. Okay, and thank you very much. Salud, thank salud you very much. Morning, everybody, be healthy, be healthy, everybody. Thank you so much. I just want to remind you that we tomorrow have an um, independent project, uh, one man show, uh, Omar Hayam's uh, The Wave Catcher, directed by Barzu Abrazakov and actor Aigri Mustafa. Exactly at two o'clock, we'll, I'm going to welcome you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Laura. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.